Welcome to Bayesian Statistics. We're talking about the normal distribution again. Last time, this is right where we left off on this exact slide. Why do I have this all here? Because we're going to worry about these conditional distributions. We ultimately want to be able to sample from the posterior distribution of mu and sigma squared given the data. That's ultimately what we're after. And we're going to see if we can't do that in this video by using Gibbs sampling. All right, so for Gibbs sampling, we're going to talk a little bit about the theory here. But if I have some starting values, um, x0 and y0, and I sample x1 from x given y0, y equals y0. So I'm just going to pull from that distribution. And then I take that sample that I just got from there, this x1 that I just pulled, and then I pull from y given x equals x1, then the pair x1, y1 are a sample from x, y, uh, so this gives us a sample from the joint density. And if we do this at any point, this is what's considered Gibbs sampling, okay? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you'll see how it works here in a second because we're going to do it in code. So we're going to start some starting values. Uh, the next sample for x, or our parameter maybe mu, will depend on our last value of sigma squared, and we're going to sample from that given we know sigma squared. And then if this was sigma squared, we're going to say, well, now that we know what the mean is, what's sigma squared given we know the mean? And then this pair, which would be maybe mu sigma squared, will be a sample from our joint distribution that we're looking for. All right, so this makes it pretty easy to do this. Um, and this is exactly the idea of Gibbs sampling. It's actually a little more complicated than this, but as we will use JAGS to do most of our sampling, I'm not going to get too far into it, but... Uh, right now, we're just going to make up our first Gibbs sampler, and then we're going to draft drift off the Jags as we go through the course. All right. Uh, so these things are called full conditionals. The uh, f given uh, f of x given y, and we got f of y given x. So we need both of those in order to make this happen. Sure enough, we have both of these in the normal case. We have mu given d and sigma squared, and we have sigma squared given d and mu. So we can iterate between these two in sampling and take the answer out of one and plug it into the other and see what happens. All right, so we have our full conditionals. We can make this work. Okay, so let's get uh, to an example. Rania is interested in the lengths of bottlenose dolphins living in the Atlantic Ocean. She thinks they're likely to be about 350 centimeters long, plus or minus 60 centimeters. Okay, we can use this to create a distribution for mu. Well, we've got the mean here, 350, and plus or minus 60 cm, well, 60 squared might be our variance. How to choose v for the prior for sigma squared? Well, unless you know a lot about what you're doing, usually pick a small number, maybe three or four. For an inverse chi-squared, if you chose number one, it has no mean or variance. If you chose two, it has a mean but no variance. Once we get to three, we actually get a variance. Uh, so don't, don't go too small because it may cause problems later. Uh, so this is what we're going to choose. And the sigma squareds are going to match here. All right, so she goes out on a research expedition and gets this data. So uh, we're going to use this data, and we're going to see what we can pull from it. Okay, so here's what we have. We have all the pieces that we need. The sum of the xi, 2, 2, 8, 4, n is equal to 7. Um, now we can jump off to R and start building this. And I know we're going pretty fast here, but again, we're only going to do this once. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to work on these pieces first. And you'll see the code sort of build its way up in a nonlinear fashion because I program from the inside out. I don't know how to program from the beginning to the end. So I start in the middle and then I make my way out. So here's some pieces in the middle. And how do I get this? Sigma squared zero is equal to 60 squared. And I know is seven. Mu uh, variance is equal to this piece here as one over sigma, uh, so it's this piece here actually, one over sigma squared uh, sub zero and over sigma two. Okay, I get that piece. Okay, now I got some data here, my x's, and now I have mu zero, I need 360 involved. And then I'm gonna get the sum one is the sum of the x one. So it's just gonna add those up. And then my mu sum here is going to be mu over mu zero over sigma squared zero plus my sum of the xi's divided by sigma squared. 
All right, so we're moving on here. We're going to get this piece, and it happens to be this piece as well. Um, so now that I get this piece, um, it's going to be, well, that's easy. Mu plus n, or v plus n. And we know that v was, we picked it to be 4. All right, so then we calculate our scale parameter here. So we're going to need the sum 2, which is going to be this piece here, the sum uh, from i equals 1 to n of xi minus mu squared. And then I'm going to put it all together and get the red piece here, which is what these bottom two lines give me. All right, so now that I have this, I can do the sampling. So you'll see here I added some sampling in here. I have mu1 is R norm 1, and it has my uh, mean that I'm interested in and my variance that I'm interested in that I've already calculated. Okay, then I'm going to take mu1 out of there, and it gets plugged into my sum 2. See, there it ends up right there. And then we're going to pull from a uh, chi-squared by multiplying the scale times my uh, post uh, degrees of freedom, divide that by a chi squared one, uh, which means we're pulling one sample and the post degrees of freedom. And sure enough, I will get an inverse chi squared out of this. All right, we're almost there. Now we got to put it in a loop. And since we're putting it in a loop, we got to make some containers to hold the answer. Okay, now notice that's a lot of stuff left the picture. I don't have the n and the v and the sigma squared and the mu naught anymore, or the, even the x's in my code. Uh, leave it in your code. Uh, this would just be reorganizing pieces. So I get sigma squared of 10. Notice this is our starting value. I have to start someplace. Uh, mu1 out, and we're going to do only 10 steps here. Uh, we're going to repeat uh, 0, 10 times for a container. Sigma squared out. Repeat 0, 10 times for a container. This is the code I had in the other one, except at the bottom, I'm saving off my mu values. So mu1 out in the ith position is equal to the mu1 that I found at this iteration of the Gibbs sampler. Sigma squared out i in the ith position is sigma squared that I found from this iteration. And notice they're both random sampled along the way. All right, we're almost there. Okay, so what does this do? So if I went five steps, you can see the green is where I started, the red is where I stopped. I move here and I move that direction. I'm moving, so I'm moving uh, like uh, in perpendicular directions every time. So every time I go, I'm moving in a perpendicular direction because this axis is mu, this axis is sigma squared. Now, if I increase that, if I went to 100, I started at the green dot, ends at the red dot, and I sampled all, went to all these places in between here. Uh, I can go more and fill it in more and even more. Um, so this is 10,000 steps of Gibbs sampling. Now, what's interesting is we only keep the after we've taken two steps in this case, or however many parameters you are, that's how many steps you're going to take. And this is what the data set looks like. Okay, so this is what my samples look like for my problem here that I was worried about. So this is about the dolphins. Okay, the mean is about 330, and this is sigma squared. Um, and what I can do is I can use these samples to make inferences. I can take a histogram along this axis, and I can take a histogram along this axis. I can get quantiles along this axis or this axis, whatever I want. It gives me ability to make inferences about the uh, posterior distribution even though I don't actually have a nice formed, close form posterior distribution. So if I make the histogram of mu given d, so I'm ignoring sigma squared. All I did was take this picture and did a histogram along here, took all of these points and basically pushed them down along the uh, mu axis here. Okay, and that's what I get. I do the same thing for the variant, sigma squared given d, and I can come up with this table here. Okay, so these are my quantiles. Over here, I get a credible interval, standard deviation, a median, a mean, and I get it for both parameters. But if you noticed here, my mean, mu given d, does not depend on sigma squared. Okay, so it's a marginal summary. Uh, and that's what we're going to, this is from a marginal distribution. So uh, mu given d no longer depends on the value of sigma squared. All right, now that we made it this far, let's take a break. Um, 
but this is the essence of Gibbs sampling. If you kept up with all the code or go back and get all the code and run it, that's what Gibbs sampling is. Is it sample one, stick it in the other, sample it, stick it in the other, sample it, and along the way, save it off once you've got two new samples or each parameter has a new sample. Uh, and that's Gibbs sampling. Now, what we're going to use is JAGS to do all of this and RJAGS. So uh, that's going to be what we're going to start going into next. So see you in the next video. Thank you